Mr. Taman, thank you for making time for, for this interview. No, thank you for this opportunity. So in 2001, um, I'm just curious, who persuaded you to enter politics? And um, how do you make this decision? And was it a difficult one and, and, and why? I was asked to enter politics by that time DPM, Lee Sien Lung, because they were looking for candidates. And I thought about it and discussed it with my wife, but it wasn't a very difficult decision. It is the type of adult decision you have to make, where even if you have disagreed with the government on issues in the past, and I had disagreed with the government on issues in the past, even when I was working in government, even on the Marxist conspiracy, so the so-called Marxist conspiracy. I had been political from well before I joined uh, the civil service. I was, so to speak, on the other side when I was young. I was a critic. I was a student activist and critic. Uh, through my years in the MES as a chief economist, eventually a managing director, uh, I retained my sense of idealism, but my sense of what was practical and workable kept evolving. But I remain, my ideals remained, let's work for more just and socially progressive society. That remained. You make an adult decision, how best are you going to contribute to Singapore? Some do it outside government, some do it in civil society. And I decided, given my expertise and my knowledge of the system, and my sense of what I could contribute as a minister, uh, I wanted to do it in government. And doing it as a minister allowed me to play a much more active role in reshaping policies and critically being on the ground. I really wanted to be on the ground. I wanted to be on the ground day after day, week after week, throughout the year. Mr. Taman, in the hustings so far, the word independent or being independent from the government has been used by many non-establishment PE candidates to describe themselves. You know, when you launched your bid to be president, you mentioned your independence of mind. How have you displayed this uh, independence of mind in, in your work in cabinet? And um, are there times where you have uh, disagreed with uh, your former colleagues? Right. Well, I believe in independence of mind. And I also believe that um, the presidency um, is one that requires independence of mind. I believe that uh, very firmly. It is a characteristic that has to go together with a knowledge of the system, a knowledge of our reserves, a knowledge of our economic challenges in future, a knowledge even about our environmental challenges in future, climate change. But it also has to go together with trust. There has to be trust between the president and the people, the president and the government, and respect on all sides. If independence of mind means you're a solo player, just taking your own position for the sake of it, you'll soon be isolated. And people will know that, well, you're an interesting figure with views of your own, but nothing comes out of it. And very importantly, you will also not be taken seriously internationally. So independence of mind is required, particularly in fulfilling the executive functions of the presidency, protecting our reserves, making the best use of them, protecting the integrity of the public service. But you also need more than that. You need more than that. You need the ability of working with government, working with people, and being taken very seriously internationally. I just happen to have a track record going back way before my government years. In fact, before my years even in the public service, in the civil service, um, of having an independent streak. I was always someone, however, who felt that being independent means you've got to engage in debate, engage in discussion with your colleagues, your teammates, in ways that find some common ground. It's not just being a gadfly. You've got to be able to use your independence of mind to persuade others and to find consensus. And I've always been like that. But even those years when I was in government and cabinet, 22 years, something that's not very well known is we have intense debates. We have intense debates, stretching hours I mean, our cabinet meetings <laughs> take an entire afternoon sometimes and spill well into the evening. And sometimes we can't agree 
after the debate, we come back the next week or two weeks later and we carry on. Intense debates between people with different perspectives, we all share the same objective usually, but sometimes wanting, some of us wanting to go further than others, but some of us wanting a different method from others. And that started from Mr. Lee Kuan Yew's time, and I had the great privilege of being in cabinet for 11 years with Mr. Lee Kuan Yew present every week. It carried on in Mr. Go Chok Tong's time. It carries on in today's PM Lee Sien Lung's time. That culture of debate and openness to all views. And my colleagues know I have an independence of mind and I have certain perspectives as well, particularly on social and economic policies. Since early in my life, I believe that we need to work hard through government action, community action, and everyone getting involved in building a fairer, more progressive, and more just society. And it has informed my position on a whole set of issues, social and economic. So that's been my track record. People who know me know what I'm like. Uh, I don't need to go around beat, thumping my chest and saying I'm independent. Uh, but people who know me know what I'm like. Within the government, as well, if I might say, within the opposition as well. Before you enter politics, you, you say that you've never been known as a, as a yes man and uh, you, know, you have great respect for alternative views. Can you share some examples of how this unique ability of yours have helped create a positive impact and also um, shape policy making and, and governance over, over the years? Well, you know, my whole motivation for entering politics was never partisan. I entered politics first because I wanted to serve on the ground and second because I wanted to help reshape policies. And I've always had a non-partisan bent of mind, listening to alternative views, discussing it with people who disagree. And quite frankly, if you look at my interactions with members of the opposition over the years, you'll be able to see that. In the early years, in fact, even from my very first year as a minister, or at that time I was a senior minister of state, with Cham Si Tong in parliament, with Lo Tia Kiang, I remember they, had, they always asked good questions, you know. And I remember Cham Si Tong asking me about whether teaching of Confucianism and traditional cultures might inhibit independent or critical thinking. It was a very good question. And I took it very seriously, gave him respect for his question. Uh, I had a different point of view. Lo Tia Kiang and I, over many years, had exchanges in Parliament, which were always respectful. I actually liked his questions. He had a sharp mind, but he was always very shrewd in the way he put across his questions. And I liked answering Lo Tia Kiang in Parliament, giving him, giving him respect, explaining my position, either with the facts or explaining why I take a different view, but sometimes agreeing with him as well. And by the way, I mean, just, just on that point, so I will single out Lo Tia Kiang as someone whom I always appreciated listening to and understanding where he was coming from. I was no longer running a ministry when Pritam Singh took over as leader of the opposition, so I wasn't answering questions in parliament. But uh, during COVID, for a significant part of COVID, I was sitting beside Pritam Singh because we had to space out everyone in parliament and I was sitting beside him. And on several occasions, after his colleagues spoke about an issue, I would tell Pitam that was a point very well made. Or sometimes I would say, I don't think that point is well made. Or maybe that was a bit too opportunistic and not quite the right way to make the point. So I was always very frank. Again, this is not, I'm, I'm not beating my chest to say, look, hello, I'm independent or independent minded. But I've had a non-partisan view and it's been shown in my track record all along. Mr. Taman, just now you mentioned about um, the late Mr. Lee Kuan Yew and you know how uh, you know he was of course present in some of the um, very intense cabinet discussions. Just just wondering, um, you know, who are your political mentors? I honestly have learned from a lot of people. From Mr. Lee, of course, you know, he's always been up there for all of us. He had a very stern demeanor in public, but in our cabinet meetings. He was remarkable for, for just listening to everyone. And even when I came in as a young senior minister of state, eventually a young minister, he would really listen and debate. 
he'd sort of stare at you and listen to you and you know he's really listening. And that aspect of Mr. Lee stuck in my mind. That aspect of him stuck in my mind, that he took seriously people with serious views. Mr. Go Chok Tong has always had an influence on me because of his very rounded perspective of things, his very human perspective of things, and his shrewd way of explaining issues. Our current PM has, I've worked with him very closely, he has a remarkably sharp mind and absorptive capacity. Um, he's just unusual. He absorbs everything very quickly and he makes very good judgments. I'm mentioning them because they were Prime Ministers, but I'll just say that all my colleagues have been very useful influencers as well, senior and junior, and very importantly, people outside government, whom I spend a lot of time interacting with and discussing serious issues with, have all been part of the constant shaping and reshaping of my thinking. People who work with me on the ground, many of whom, by the way, are not PAP supporters even. It's been a little unusual because in Taman Jurong, where I've been working all these years, many of my very active supporters, I honestly don't know how they vote in the general elections, but they, they really want to contribute. And we have serious discussions on a whole set of issues. So both within government, with the opposition, as well as people on the ground, including in civil society, people have influenced me. I don't believe in having a single hero and you sort of look up to them and try and model yourself after a hero. I believe in listening to a whole range of people and being yourself. Never sticking with what you believed 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it's important for us, each I feel, I feel to be that way. During your media conference, you mentioned that you, know, you have no regrets at all of having been in the PAP and serving as a politician, you know, being on the ground for 22 years. Uh, you have no regrets being part of a team because this is what uh, has enriched you. Looking back, what was the one highlight in your career and uh, what is the one disappointment in, in your career? The highlights were both the learning on the ground and the listening and working and sharing on the ground I've had, which has been the most um, valuable experience in my life, myself and my wife, who was with me very often in Taman Jurong. I would not give that up for anything. It would not have happened if I wasn't in politics. Just interacting with people day in, day out, spending hours and sometimes weeks with specific individuals or families who really needed my support and help. Not doing it because of votes, because at best you get one vote or two votes, but you spend weeks on it because it's going to change their life. There was a girl who came to see me when she was 15. She was at Hong Kong Secondary, normal technical. Father had run off at an early age. Mother was in prison. Brother was in prison, living on her own working two jobs and during the holidays three jobs to make ends meet. But talking to her, I sensed a certain spark and a certain resilience deep in her. First, being bold enough to come and see me and just tell me exactly what's been happening. And we had a very long conversation. My wife then had a very long conversation with her. I got a group of volunteers together. Let's help her transform her life. First, she was stateless. Born in Singapore, father Singaporean, but for some quirk, she was stateless. I wrote an impassioned plea to, the, to ICA, and they took it very seriously, very sympathetically, because she was true blue Singaporean, in fact, got her citizenship. Second, got a group of students, in fact, from River Valley High, three of them to come and tutor her for her normal tech exams. She did well went on, progressed, made it to poly, succeeded in graduating from poly, and in fact, just a few months ago, emailed me very emotionally to say how she succeeded and she'll never forget having met me and my wife 
12 years ago. And she's now got a good job and she's now wants to go on to do university. And there are many cases like that. You've got to stay with them, never judge them, certainly never look down on them, stay with them, become friends and help them transform their own lives, earn their own success. So that's given me great satisfaction. At the policy level, I would say, while everyone knows me as a finance minister for eight years, a deputy prime minister and so on, and for all my international roles, the thing that has given me greatest satisfaction is my involvement in education. My five years as a minister, but my continuing involvement in education, including Skills Future subsequently, gives me the greatest sense of satisfaction because it's still the most important way in which we shape individuals and we shape society. It's both economic and social policy. I do feel that what was most meaningful in what I did was to start freeing up the education system, making it more flexible, moving away from a rigid streaming system, doing away with primary school streaming, doing away with ranking of schools, blurring the differences between students, especially at an early age, allowing for new paths, including the specialized schools, arts, sports, science and maths, but also North Light and Assumption Pathway, which I take great pride in. But it was not my thinking, solo thinking. I had a motivation, a desire for more fair and progressive society, but it was not my solo thinking. Most of my ideas in education came from teachers and principals. I still think we've got a further evolution in our education system to achieve the fullest potential amongst our kids, particularly those who start off a little bit behind or those who have different talents which are not quite recognized. And I still feel that there's too much pressure on our children too early in life. But we have to evolve, not with sudden radical movements, sudden radical changes. We have to keep evolving and keep listening to teachers and principals. That continuum of developing people from their youngest years through Kid Start, through Skills Future, to their mature years, is what's going to shape the new Singapore. A Singapore where everyone has the dignity of doing a job with skill, and everyone is respected. My real, my real um, sadness, I would say, uh, has been to leave Jurong, and particularly Taman Jurong, which I've been part of for so long, over 22 years. Uh, it was very sad. It was very, very sad. Um, and in fact, when I had a farewell day and several thousand people turned up, it was very emotional for me, for my wife and for many of them. There have been several points in my career, particularly in the last 10 years, when I've been approached by people internationally to ask me to stand for various positions, really running some of the leading international organizations. And some very senior people called me up. And the conversation was always short. I always just told them, I'm sorry, I'm elected by the people in my constituency. And there's no, no greater pride than to serve my own country. I will continue to contribute internationally by chairing panels, by, by supporting policy reform internationally in other ways. And I've been quite active in doing that. But I do not want to leave Singapore and I can't leave the people who elected me. Now I've had to leave the people who elected me because I'm taking on a different role in Singapore. And fortunately, the vast majority of people in Taman Jerome, in fact, everyone who's come forward to speak to me, has supported me. We all have sadness about the fact that I'm not going to be there on the ground with them all the time, but they have supported me and they know why I'm doing it. But it's sad. Mr. Mr. Taman, you mentioned about um, you know, how tough it was for you emotionally to, to leave Taman Jurong. So um, I'm wondering, um, you know, why then do you want to take on this, this new, new, new challenge as well? Um, why do you want to be um, the next president? I had to leave Taman Jurong because you have to be out of politics. Everyone understands that. Uh, my motivation is I feel that I can add to optimism in our future, at a time when the challenges are going to be greater than ever before. 
People think that the traditional of the role of the president is some ceremonial stuff. It's much more than that, and it must be much more than that. My experience on the ground over all these years has given me the conviction that we will only succeed if we develop a deeper culture of respect for everyone, particularly those with the disadvantage, the single mums, those who need a second chance. We will only succeed if we have greater respect for people with different views and always try and find common ground. And that culture of respect is something I believe very deeply in. It's what gives people dignity, avoids anyone feeling humiliated or looked down upon. And it's what gives everyone a sense that even if we have different views, we are Singaporean. And we have to be more Singaporean than ever before. Because our society will be one where differences of views are going to grow. It's a natural maturing of our democracy, and I've always said it's healthy. But it has to be very actively managed so that the center stays strong, center of values, center of aspirations. And I think as a president, I really want to push that culture of respect for all. Secondly, internationally, we're entering times that are more troubled than we've seen in more than 40 years. The trajectory in US-China relations is not looking good. We are seeing a bit of a pause now, but it's not looking good. We are entering really troubled times, and it will affect everyone. I believe my international standing in all the major countries, China, India, the United States, my friends in Southeast Asia, and of course the Europeans, uh, will be useful. I can play an active role not just Singap flying the Singapore flag high, because it's not just about our self-interest, but helping to project the Singapore voice of reason internationally, because we are taken seriously. And I intend to be quite active in supporting Singapore's international role so that we are never viewed as just another small country. Now, both those dimensions, on the ground initiatives to create a culture of respect, strengthening Singapore's standing and contributions to the world are part of the traditional role of a presidency, not the new executive powers. But that traditional role is going to be more important than ever before. I believe that. And I've stepped forward in part because I think I can play an active role in both regards and build optimism in Singapore and build faith in Singapore from outside Singapore as well. And then you have the executive role, where obviously I have extensive experience and expertise. Um, and I believe that the years to come are going to be ones where the use of reserves is going to be a much more important issue than it has been in the past. We first used it during the global financial crisis when I was a finance minister. Then we used it in much larger quantum during COVID, necessarily. We now have Singar bonds, which is borrowing for long-term infrastructure, but effectively it amounts to a reduction in our net assets because we are borrowing more. And the president had to approve this major initiative. But we'll have challenges in the future because crises are going to keep coming, unfortunately. The pandemics are going to keep coming. Economic crises are going to keep coming. Plus, you have the slow burn crisis of climate change and the shift in the world's environmental balance, which is going to affect all of us. And Southeast Asia is going to be, be one of the most worst affected regions by climate change and the rising sea levels. We'll have to think hard about how we finance the long-term infrastructure to protect future generations. So you need knowledge, expertise, judgment, and an ability to have a balanced mind. I intend to actively project Singapore's voice internationally, plus that executive role of protecting and making the best use of reserves and protecting the integrity of the civil service and the public service. Each of these three roles will be more important in the future than before. And that's why I decided it was time for me to take on this new role. Mr. Taman, in 1992, you were charged under the Official Secrets Act for being implicated with leaking figures to the Business Times. You pleaded not guilty and you fought the case. 
but was fined for breaching um, the OSA during this period, you know, between 1992 to 1994. Um, is it considered a low point in your life? Well, it was a strange episode, let me put it that way. First, I believed then, as I believed all along, that if there are leaks of official secrets, we have to take action, have an investigation and let the law take its course, including prosecuting people in court if need be. I believed it then and I said so. Um, they got the wrong man. Put simply, uh, the prosecution knew that an official figure had been leaked. They knew who it got to. They needed to find a source. It would have been more difficult, not impossible, but more difficult for them to prosecute those who received or used the information without also being able to prosecute someone who was a source. Uh, the whole case started off with me being a source and charged with communicating that figure. And communication means you're intentionally communicating. Of course, I pleaded not guilty because I knew I did nothing of the sort. And the case fell through. The it was a long case. We spent a year and a half in, in court, you know. Not continually, but it stretched over that period. And the prosecution case fell flat because there was absolutely no evidence of me communicating anything. To the credit, by the way, of the Attorney General at the time, Mr. Chan Sing Kyong, um, whom I regard as a person of high integrity, late in the prosecution's case, uh, he stood up in court. He was personally in court, leading the prosecution, by the way, the Attorney General himself. Um, and he stood up in court and told the judge that if the court decides that there's no case against the first defendant, who was myself, the prosecution will be willing to proceed without me. He actually told the court, and I, I respect him for that, because he realized as the case proceeded that there was no case against me on communication. The prosecution did not ask for a new charge to be introduced, which was a lesser charge of negligence in how you handle your papers at a meeting. Uh, but the judge decided on his own to introduce it. And so the case carried on. And there too, I pleaded not guilty because there was never any evidence that the figure was actually cited at this meeting that I was at between a group of private sector economists and me and my colleague. There was never any evidence. It was an inference. I was the only one of the five defendants who took to the witness stand to defend myself. The other four opted, as they, was their right, not to take to the witness stand. I insisted on doing so. And I defended myself over a few days, answered all questions, and explained my position because I knew I wasn't guilty. Eventually, the court decided, nevertheless, to uh, find me guilty of this charge of mishandling my documents uh, and fine me $1,500. The others were fined $2,000. So be it. But what was very interesting for me was this. There were people very senior in the system who supported me right through. And they all told me, fight it to the end. Fight it to the end. The MAS could have easily interdicted me. There I was, a senior official in MAS. I was the director of the economics department, basically the chief economist. They could have easily interdicted me, put me on leave. They didn't. I continued to work at the MAS all the way through, all the way through. In fact, there were even board meetings where I would be there giving the presentations, and Mr. Chan se -kyung, the Attorney General, was a member of our board on the other side. They never suspended me for a, for a day. They gave me time off to attend, go to court. And then in the middle of the case, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, then senior minister, was asked by the Prime Minister of Pakistan to visit, make an assessment of Pakistan's challenges, and provide advice to Pakistan. And he asked me to come with him to assist in make, doing the analysis and in drafting a report. So it was a strange case, but my integrity was never in doubt. I do not think I was right to eventually be found guilty of that charge of negligence because there's no evidence. And I'll tell you something very interesting there because this is not just my opinion. The case of negligence was that I had papers with me, which I never denied, which had the figure on the papers, 
and across the table, the private sector economists could have cited it. That was the case for negligence. So the prosecution actually brought the table into the courtroom. It was a wonderful moment. The same table was brought into the courtroom. It had been kept all the while, taken out of MAS and kept all the while, and there, lo and behold, we had the table in the courtroom, and the prosecution witness was asked to come and sit at one end, and the same paper I had was put at the other end where I was sitting. And they asked her, what do you see? And she said, she cannot see the figure. So the inference was not even backed by the evidence. So that, that was it. It was a very strange case. There was no evidence against me, but I held nothing against the system because no one was trying to get me. No one was trying to get me. And I felt that the OSA was important. When there's a breach of the OSA, we should take action. They just got the wrong man. The OSA case didn't actually involve a psychological setback for me. But I must say the person who took the brunt of it was my wife. I had two excellent lawyers. One, Shalva Ratnam Raja, um, and second, my wife, who was assisting him. But what was interesting was this, that because the case stretched over such a long period, at the start of the case, she had just given birth to our second child, and she was nursing him, breastfeeding him. It was honestly quite a um, uh, difficult time for us at home because we had just given birth, she had just given birth to our second child. But then, uh, she became expectant again during the case, and <laughs> she was heavily pregnant, because it's one and a half years, she was very heavily pregnant towards the end. She was actually carrying out her child, and coming to court every day, someone had to help her with the files and so on, of course, and we had to, I remember, request for a postponement of one of the hearings uh, so that she could deliver. Fortunately, the court agreed. And we would uh, be going every day to the lawyer's office carrying this lovely rattan basket. I think they still have these lovely rattan baskets for, for babies. The newborn baby would be coming in and out of the lawyer's office every day and being placed in the lawyer's office while we're having all our serious discussions. I remember Jane made this quip to um, the reporters because the case was taking so long uh, about how she wasn't sure who was going to deliver the first, the judge or her. As it, her, as, as it happened, she delivered first. But it was a tough time for Jane. Just now you mentioned about you know, building this culture of respect. And this culture of respect among races would be very important. Do you think race will play a role in this election? Race plays a role in politics everywhere in the world. And I think Singaporeans are fair-minded. They do look at the whole suite of attributes you bring, the whole, your whole cast of mind, your character, your track record, their sense as to whether you really have empathy for people on the ground. That's what they look at, not just race. I don't think I would have had my record in Jurong if race was the only factor. Second, I've always had um, a rapport with all our communities, Chinese, Malay, Indian, Eurasian, because of constant interaction. I've been interacting with the Chinese community for years. I don't only mean residents on the ground, obviously, but our temple organizations, our clan associations, uh, our chambers of commerce, the SMEs. Again, that's the privilege I have from having been in politics, that long-standing interaction and rapport I've had with each of the communities that um, gives me confidence that race is not going to be a big issue in these elections. It's never absent in politics anywhere, in a general election, either at a constituency level or at a national level. But it's not the only factor. People look at your overall abilities and especially at your track record and their sense of the character you bring. Mr. Tama, as we, you know, mentioned about elections as well. Uh, there's always, you know, there's a, there's a winner, there's a, there's a loser as well. Um, I'm just wondering, did um, losing in, in the presidential election ever cross your mind? Never in my years 
have I been overconfident in any contest. It was true even when I was in politics. And I always gave respect to my opponents. You'll notice that in, in Jurong. Um, and even nationally, you'll notice that. The results of the presidential elections will be, made by, will be determined by Singaporeans. I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Uh, I obviously wouldn't have entered this race if I didn't think I stood a, a fair chance of um, being chosen by Singaporeans. I've never wanted to be overconfident. I was a sportsman when I was young. You never take the view that your opponents are small and you're big and you're going to win. Never take that view. Um, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to see more, don't forget to click on the subscribe button and the notification bell.